series is to enable some of the new work and research being undertaken around the New Zealand coast to be shared with the wider coastal community. A driver for the series is the cancellation of the NZCS conference in its usual form um, this year, meaning that the usual forum for sharing and disseminating this work won't be available until the Coast Supports Conference in Christchurch next year, which abstracts are opening for in September and I'd encourage people to submit to. Um, so this webinar series is really intended to fill that gap, um, but based on the positive response for our corporate abstracts and the general turnout here, um, it's something we may look to continue through the future. So we've got a great series lined up over the coming months uh, with some really diverse and interesting topics. We are likely to have space at this point um, open towards the end of the year, so if people have a topic that they would like to present on, feel free to get in touch through the NCTS uh, email address. Um, I'll hand over to Colin Whitaker, who is the University Representative on the Management Committee, to introduce you to our two presentations for today. Tēnā koutou, over to you, Colin. Great. Thanks very much, Tom. And uh, as Tom said, welcome everyone to our Coastal Society webinar series. I'm going to be introducing the speakers in the order that they will be speaking, uh, which is slightly different to what we uh, originally advertised. And uh, I'll also be uh, joining us again later to uh, help to deliver the questions to the speakers. Please, uh, as Holly mentioned before, do use the chat window during the presentation uh, when you have questions, uh, and we'll attempt to get to as many of those as possible after the presentations. So uh, the first speaker that I'd like to introduce, uh, and I'll introduce all the speakers, then we'll get started with Pablo's talk, is Pablo Higuera. Pablo is a lecturer in coastal engineering at the University of Auckland. His research field is computational fluid dynamics, or CFD, applied to solving coastal and offshore problems such as wave hydrodynamics, wave structure interaction, hydraulics, and environmental flows. Uh, and he's currently developing the CFD model OLA flow within OpenFlow, which can be applied to simulate uh, coastal and offshore structures. We'll then be joined by Jao uh, Albuquerque, Laura Kakekal, uh, apologies for the pronunciation there, and Giovanni Coco. Uh, all three of them work at the University of Auckland and they've been working on a hazard platform funded project over the past three to four years. Jao is a computer science, he's also lectured in Brazilian universities uh, and he's completing his PhD with a focus on wave hindcasts and projections for New Zealand. Laura is also working towards the completion of her PhD but her focus is the development of wave emulators with a specific focus on Pacific atolls. She's also developed the storm surge analysis, hindcast and projection. Giovanni Coco is an associate professor at the University of Auckland uh, and he's worked extensively on a variety of coastal topics, uh, primarily with a modelling approach. So it's now my pleasure to hand over to Pablo for the first of our presentations and thank you again everyone for joining us. Okay, let me start this. Um, I'm Pablo Higuera and today I will be talking about uh, composite modeling. It's a pity that this year we have had kind of these kind of circumstances, otherwise I would have been able to meet you in person uh, because um, I've just recently joined the, the University of Auckland and I would love to, to meet you all. Um, a little bit of my background first, uh, so that you can understand uh, a little bit what I do and what are my interests. Um, I gained my PhD, Bachelor and uh, Master's in Coastal Engineering at the University of Cantabria in Spain, where I'm from. And I then joined the Imperial College and NUS as a postdoc for a couple of years, before joining the University of Auckland uh, late last year as a lecturer in uh, Coastal Engineering. My interest, as Colin has introduced before, are CFD, mainly fluid structure interaction and scale effects, wave hydrodynamics of all sorts uh, regarding surf and swash flows, uh, wave focusing, and uh, a little bit also on active wave absorption both at the lab and in the maritime park. But today my presentation is going to be about composite modeling, which uh, for some of you might be uh, some a new concept. The outline is going to be as follows. I'm going to first motivate and uh, help you understand what composite modeling is. 
I will then define it and uh, then I will show you some application and I will finish off with some uh, future prospects. I, I will try to do this within time, within 15 to 20 minutes. Um, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, there are lots of things that are going to be out, but feel free to ask me any questions in the end or catch up with me later. So whenever you're designing a coastal structure, or this is not constrained to coastal structures, but to offshore or any other structure, you may have three uh, main ways to design that. Those are uh, semi-empirical formulations, laboratory scale modeling, and numerical modeling. Here you see a diagram on how all these are linked, and I will hopefully convey you that they're not independent, but they're connected somehow in this presentation. So let's start with semi-empirical formulations. Semi-empirical formulations are just very simple or complex mathematical expressions and look at the tables. Uh, we are engineers and we love to use them because they're, they're pretty, pretty simple. And they're usually based on adjusted uh, dimensional analysis of sets of laboratory experiments. So lots of different experiments combined together into these uh, magnificent formulas that uh, help you to simulate the uh, structural response in a simplified way. Some examples of these, uh, everyone has used Hudson's formula or Godet's method to uh, design uh, vertical or rubble mount structures. Kakuno uh, is another one which is very useful to calculate the reflection of, of um, sleep type breakwaters. But basically there are thousands and thousands of formulas out there that follow uh, the semi-empirical formulation uh, way to design structures. Those are usually developed uh, based on physical modeling. And what physical modeling is, is basically you, you take your structure, you downscale it and build it, and then you test it. You test the real conditions. Obviously, you're constrained uh, because of size and because of the weight conditions that you can test. But normally, you can test most of the conditions that would be applied in nature. And this allows you to um, reflect on, on how your structure is responding to these waves. So basically, it allows you to create your own ad hoc semi-empirical formulation for your particular structure. Here are some uh, examples on physical modeling facilities around the world. Some of them are very well known, like Toprite, uh, Hanover, um, Flume, or uh, bottom left, the circular uh, wave flume in uh, Scotland. And basically, physical modeling is a very fun part in, in the design process because it allows you to test and destroy structures that you would normally don't expect to fail in, in real life. Now, we move on to uh, a more recent approach because numerical modeling has been introduced just lately. And it's very, very similar to physical modeling, uh, although it does not involve you creating a structure physically, it allows you to simulate the same structure using computers and numbers. So again, uh, this one allows you to test any wave conditions virtually, and you will be able to simulate your uh, structural response same as the uh, laboratory experiment does. Uh, later on, we will compare both approaches so that we can see um, how, how they compare each, to each other. But as of now, uh, here are some examples on what you can do with numerical modeling. Basically, you can do whatever you can imagine uh, within the limits of uh, having a reasonable amount of cells and a reasonable amount of simulation time. So that includes uh, wave generators. Uh, it includes hydraulics, floating structures, uh, offshore vessels, coastal structures, basically whatever you can imagine. So if we compare uh, physical modeling with numerical modeling, we will take a uh, couple of minutes to do that. And, and we'll take our own, um, our own decisions then. So physical modeling is usually expensive because it relies on using facilities that are somewhat special. And they're um, like people um, book these facilities and they're 
book most of the time. So that high demand drives an increase in price. It's also something that takes intensive and recurrent labor. So if you're testing your structure, you need to build it. Uh, and then if in some of the tests it gets destroyed, you need to start again and build it again. Whereas in numerical modeling, we're looking at something that is somewhat affordable um, because you don't need these specific facilities. You just need your computer. Um, sometimes this is a little bit uh, oversimplified because you may need high performance computing facilities, but these are widely accessible uh, and because they, they can be applied to lots of different problems and uh, ours is just one problem that they, they can solve. And a, good, a very good part of numerical modeling is that you can make everything automatized. So you can select one case or you can select 1,000 cases and run everything in batch. That does not mean that you need to redo your structure every single time it gets destroyed, but you can already have that built into your model. So um, in that sense, uh, numerical modeling has some clear advantages. Let's continue with uh, the disadvantages for numerical modeling. Well, in physical modeling, you basically observe results in real time. Everyone that sees a physical modeling test uh, working is convinced on, on what he's, he's seeing because the results that you're, um, that you're seeing there have been uh, Based, uh, have been performed it based on like uh, water, uh, a structure that is a little bit smaller, but uh, and that can create some some scale effects. But that's usually not not an issue. Everyone is uh, convinced on, on what they can see and what they can experience. However, in numerical modeling, uh, it usually takes long time. So if you're simulating one hour six days in physical modeling, you expect to last one hour or less, whereas in numerical modeling, sometimes we're um, having like to wait for two, three, four weeks for, for that to be finished. And in the end, your numerical model is also solving uh, equations. So you need very specific options, so convergent tests and validation to um, convince people that your, your tests are right. So in that sense, um, physical modeling uh, is, is more advantageous. So if we compare both, we will notice that they're kind of uh, work, would work very, very well together. And that is what composite modeling is. So composite modeling is the integrated and balanced use of physical and numerical models. And this has been used for quite some time, so probably a little bit more than a decade. And in doing so, combining both uh, things working together, you should be able to model problems that cannot be modeled by either uh, one of them alone. Uh, you can increase the quality of the results at the same cost, or you can uh, get the same quality at a reduced cost, and you can reduce uncertainty of the results at a reasonable cost. So for example, you see here in the video um, one example that we performed in Singapore with the breaking wave in our lab and the numerical modeling side by side so that you can observe that the evolution is more or less the same. Now to apply these two guys together, you need to think very carefully on, on the methodology and this is what we are going to introduce next. This is the composite modeling framework that we usually apply and I'm going to walk you through each of the steps. We start off uh, using numerical modeling to help in the pre-design of your structure. So whether your structure needs to have certain features, whether it needs to be larger or smaller, you can use numerical modeling for that. And usually it can, it can also be applied to evaluate local 3D effects that your structure may, may create and, and help you uh, plan in advance for those. However, we need to take into account that when you're doing numerical modeling at this stage, the results may not be 100% accurate because your model, model has not been validated yet. On the next step, 
we can also apply numerical modeling to uh, design or pre-design the experiments that you are going to perform, the physical experiments. It can help you in narrowing down the test case selection, select the best location for sampling devices uh, like weight gauges or pressure sensors, and uh, more broadly to foresee any challenges or, sim or limitations that your physical experiments may encounter. Then afterwards, uh, you start your, well, obviously, uh, the numerical modeling results at this stage are also uh, not 100% uh, accurate, but that will uh, inc um, change in, in a minute. So by doing the physical experiments, you're populating a database and doing some data processing that can also help you adjust your tasting based on, on that results. So that's why you have like a two-way loop over there. The moment you start filling your database, you already have data with which you can validate your numerical model. So you can start with your grid conversion analysis, uh, test for different mesh resolutions, tuning any parameters that you may need. And as you can see, this is just a one-way loop because uh, your numerical model feeds on the uh, physical modeling data. Afterwards, while your numerical model is already validated, the two-way loop comes into play because your uh, numerical modeling will help you uh, simulate additional conditions or alternatives that were not simulated uh, physically because of constraints or because of other issues. It can also help you obtain higher resolution for some of results and it can also help you get new variables that cannot be even measured in the lab. Afterwards, if you combine both together, you should be able to obtain new uh, results and new applications that have not been, uh, you, you have not been able to obtain before. And that will help you to understand better how the structure works, to produce more complete ad hoc semi-empirical formulation, and to revise and optimize the design of your structure accordingly. So now I'm going to dash through very, very fast through an application example, which is purely hypothetical. We have applied it to real cases, but uh, this one is uh, just a dummy case. So uh, it's basically a tsunami interaction with a breakwater. We're going to go through the design, physical experiments, numerical validation, project variations, and optimization. So this is the structure that we tested in the lab. It's a high mount breakwater, which was uh, heavily monitorized. So you've got pressure sensors. You also got three surface elevation gauges, as you see in this image. Then the numerical model that we applied here to test this structure, it's called Olaflow, is the model that I'm developing. It's open source. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, OpenFOAM, it's built within OpenFOAM and it solves the Navier-Stokes equation. So it can help you give a very uh, precise definition of your uh, kinematics. Our first stage after the physical experiments involved uh, validating the model. Here you see some uh, free surface ele uh, elevation gauges comparing uh, red, the experiments, with uh, black, the uh, numerical model. And you can see that they're very, very close. We did the same with the pressure sensor, so we were pretty sure that the results were uh, very, very close together, that the model was validated. We went one step further and tested the structure to calculate the safety coefficients against sliding and overturning from the numerical modeling data, because we had a very good resolution there. And uh, the results pointed out that this was heavily uh, over design because your your safety coefficients were very 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 high so we thought why not go with a more economical still safe design so we came up with this uh, design for the usual conditions it worked perfectly the um, coefficients were were good but what happens if a tsunami hits our structure so if we have a tsunami of this kind it will create a very uh, impulsive loading there. Well, 
our safety coefficient against lighting is 0 0.87, which is below 1, so our structure is at risk of failing. So we need to design some options to help uh, protect our structure um, withstand this uh, tsunami wave. Here, uh, we, we define two different options. One is to uh, build another berm, so option A. Another one is to build a detached uh, breakwater over there. Each of these cases uh, has lots of different configurations. So uh, A has uh, five times five factors. That's 25 simulations that we needed to do. And B, you add another dimension, that's the separation between these breakwaters. So that would be a total of 100 simulations. Doing this in the uh, physical modeling would take very, very long time because you need to build lots of different alternatives, move things back and forth. But in numerical modeling, it was quite automatic. And so was automatizing the uh, way to get the results. We um, selected five different, alter uh, different uh, options to check here and check whether the structure was in the safe side, which is the blue side, or uh, not in the safe side, which was the red one. And in the end, we came only with two alternatives which uh, allowed our structure to withstand this, this tsunami. And here you can see those ones. Okay, let me play that again. So you can see that the detached brick water make the tsunami wave break. The other one just reflects more energy, so they, they allow the structure to be safe. And since we're dealing with numerical data, we have lots and lots of data to process. So we're able to calculate things that we're not able to do so that easily in the experiments. So here, for example, you can see the forces. Forces have a very, very high resolution because the, the cells are very small, and also because our time step is, is very short on the order of 10 to the minus 4 seconds. So we have 1,000 measurements per second. And it allows you to monitor and see how these different alternatives shift the uh, arrival time of the tsunami and also make the forces uh, a little bit uh, smaller. Same applies with the uh, overtopping. You can measure how these alternatives um, change the overtopping. And as you can see, having the decharge break water make the wave break and that delays the arrival of the wave and it decreases the total amount of overtopping as we see on the right figure uh, at the cost of having a little bit more of inundation depth as you see in the middle uh, panel. So finishing last 30 seconds with some future prospects. Physical modeling is bound to remain the main design approach in the near future. It's not going away uh, for good because this, uh, this methodology with numerical modeling requires physical modeling. Where, uh, however, the adoption and credibility of numerical modeling will increase, and so will demand. People will, will demand this, this kind of uh, resources. And uh, this will be more accessible and affordable in the future, too. Both uh, will be driven by the advantages of uh, composite modeling and numerical mirrors. So both will advance together in the future. And coupling different models will bring computational costs down and help uh, numerical modeling to advance further. And that is known as hybrid modeling, which I don't have any time to introduce today, but I will uh, do so if you uh, ask me any time. So this comes to the end of the presentation. So you have 30 seconds over time. and. Thanks for your attention. Hello, can you all hear me? Hello? Cameron? Yes, I'm fine. Hello, okay, cool. Uh, so we're starting our presentation here. Uh, First of all, I'd like to thank you all for attending. And we are quite excited and happy to show the work that we've been doing for the last four years. 
So we'll be talking about storm surge and wave climate projections until the end of the century for, for New Zealand. So starting, I thought I was going to be able to switch the slides. Yes. Okay, this is our introductory slide that we are actually sort of skipping because this is New Zealand Coastal Society, so I'm pretty sure that you all you're all aware of uh, the hazards and the impacts of uh, global climate and sea level rise and all these things. In case you're not, we can just quote, quote here Dr. Rob Bell. Uh, we are talking about 30,000 30, buildings and $2.3 billion of replacement costs. So this is this can provide you the magnitude of the impact of sea level rise and, and uh, global, global warming. Um, so to do this kind of estimations, you obviously need very accurate data for every, all of the variables that you're dealing with. Uh, we have people working on Wellington doing a great job with the sea level rise and the other drivers there are also uh, storm surge and waves. These are the things that we are presenting today and I am presenting the waves. So basically, to understand how the changes in the wave climate will affect New Zealand in the future, we also have to have an understanding of how the waves interacted with the New Zealand shores in the past. And so to have a better understanding of the past, we have here made available for you a partition of uh, wave hindcast for the New Zealand area. And what does that exactly mean in terms of partition and hindcast? Basically, all of the data that you have available for New Zealand in hindcasts, they will provide you the wave spectrum as a single, of a sea state, for example, as a single wave system traveling towards an average direction and with an aggregated wave height. Whereas what you would actually have, particularly for New Zealand, is in many cases you have, for example, more than five different wave systems traveling in different directions with different characteristics. Uh, so this is just for you to have an idea of how misleading these integrated parameters can be. Uh, and one more thing is that this is not exactly an example. This is actually a sea state uh, that was took from our hindcast. And this is how the integrated parameters represent these wave systems here at exactly the same place and exactly the same time. Uh, so not only this, uh, we are not only providing this partition of data for you, we are also, we corrected the wave height of, of our hindcast by comparing the wave heights from the hindcast with uh, satellite data. So this is a comparison of the satellite and the wave heights before the correction. And then after the correction, this is what we have uh, the plot on the right. Uh, and then, uh, since we are also, since we are providing the partitions for you, in case any of you actually need to downscale these waves into an even more um, even more fine resolution, you will be able to reconstruct the spectra as well and uh, propagate the waves the way they are closer to what they are. They are and not this kind of single directional monster. Uh, Still a little bit on the hindcast. Basically, we have four levels of nested grids. The information that we have available for New Zealand, for the whole New Zealand, is at nine kilometers resolution. Uh, we also have two different areas here, two different grids of one kilometer resolution, where we made, uh, we made the downscale down to one kilometer of resolution. This is Raglan, and then Tairua and Tauranga beaches, which, is, which are our uh, study sites. We made available both the bulk parameters, the integrated parameters, in case you are only interested in, in integrated parameters. This is the list of parameters that we have available. And also, we made available the partition parameters as well. Uh, and these are the, the parameters available. Um, also, this hindcast has a slightly better accuracy compared to other published hindcasts of New Zealand. And this is an example of how uh, it performs. We have here two different locations, uh, one in the west coast and one in the east coast. And you can see how well the model is capable to represent the wave height, second order period, and direction at these two different coasts. This is pretty much the hindcast. And now talking about projections, uh, there are plenty of global climate models available where you can both scale these waves and do these projections. But then comes the question of how are you supposed to select the ones that will work for New Zealand so we used this method, 
from Paris, just 2014. And basically what we do is we compare the atmospheric patterns available during the historical period uh, that we have here in, in our climate handcasts. And we compare uh, the probability of occurrence of each one of these uh, atmospheric patterns with the probabilities that the models are exhibiting during their uh, historical simulations. And then based on the difference between these two probabilities here, we can then compare the models and rank them in, the, in this sort of rank. Uh, we work with these three different models here. We are only showing you the results for the axis, which is the model that performed best within this uh, selection here. So basically, these are the plots, our results for uh, RCP 4.5 and for the end of the 21st century. This plot in the left are plots for wave height. The plot in the right are plots for wave directions. Uh, red in the wave height means wave increase. Green means wave decrease. Uh, and um, the hatchet areas here means agreement between more than one model in sign. So basically what we have here is a projected increase in the wave heights along the west coast of New Zealand and a projected decrease in the wave height along the east coast of New Zealand. Still, we would have increase in seasonality, actually not a lot because there is no convergence between the models here. But so this is the seasonal changes expected for the models as well. You can see that they change slightly uh, during the, the, the seasons. seasons. And there is also agreement between the models along the seasons. That's for both wave height and wave direction as well. Uh, and then for RCP 8.5, we are also pre uh, predicting um, an increase in the wave height in the west coast and a decrease in the east coast. And I think the wave directions are also, yeah, we, if we look at this, the same changes are expected uh, for the mean parameter of wave direction. And now this is when I hand the presentation to Laura that will talk about storm surge and handcast projections. Hello everyone, I'm going to talk to you about the storm surge handcast um, projections. Differently to what you added for the waves here in this case, instead of using a numerical model, what we do is use statistical and scaling that basically consists on finding the relationship between a predictor, which in this case is a still level person, which are the four, the four scenes of the storm surge. As we know that the most of the triggers of the storm surge are the wind and the changes on the pressure fields. So we use a multivariate regression model to find the relationship between a storm surge handcast, which is the dynamical atmospheric correction, and the principal components of the sea level pressure field. And we obtain some kind of parameters, like coefficients that like you see here, A, B, C, etc. And with those coefficients, we are able on doing the handcast using the sea level pressure fields from 20CR that cover a range from 1870 to 2010. Sorry, you can see here really the lines. And also for the projections, what we are using is the cellular pressure field of CMIP5. And we do the historical period from uh, 1979 to 2010 and the projections until 2100. In order to validate the model, what we have is the comparison of the handcast with tidal gauges. So here I'm showing you the results of the two locations highlighted in yellow in the left image. And you can see how the model is able to reproduce the daily maximum of a storm surge in both locations. And for this handcast, what we do is not only to analyze the results with those two tidal gauges, but we have 17 in the whole New Zealand area. And we have analyzed the correlation coefficients at the run mean square error for all these tidal gauges. So the comparison of the model and the tidal gauge are the squares located in each of the locations of the tidal gauge. And as you can see, most of the correlations are larger than 0 0.5, and the around mean square errors are generally smaller than 7 centimeters. We find that for some locations, which are located in semi-enclosed areas, the model performs worse because um, the accuracy of the hand that we are using for the fitting it doesn't take into account the bathymetry or these kind of local effects. Okay, so now that we have 
validated the handcuffs, we can use the same relationship to obtain the projections. So similarly, uh, as you did for the waves, what we do is to compare the patterns from the handcuffs and the global economy models and run the models. And here, instead of doing it for just three, three global economy models, at the statistical land scaling is less computationally expensive, we can do it for seven models and create continuous time series until 2100. Here I'm showing you the results of the projections at three locations for the best ranked model, which is Access 1.0, for RCP 8.5, which is the worst case scenario. And as you can see, in some locations in New Zealand, uh, a decrease in the linear trend of the annual maxima, which had the red points and the blue line in the image, is decreasing. While in other locations there is no a trend or decreasing or decreasing, and for some locations we can see a slightly increasing trend. But what is more interesting is that even when a decreasing trend is observed, we can see that there are some peaks that haven't been seen in the past, and that happens for all the three locations. So if we analyze the streams in the whole New Zealand area, we obtain these kind of results. So here, what I I am doing is to analyze the 50-year return period, comparing the projections from 2070 to 2100 with the historical realizations of the global climate models. And I'm showing you the increase and decrease of the of these extreme storm surge. So basically, red means an increasing trend, and blue means a decreasing trend. In the upper panels, I'm showing you the results for access 1.0, which, as you know, is the best rank model. And in that it leads to the waves, we see that there is an increasing trend of some sort in the west coast of the South Island and a decreasing trend in the North Island, which is even yeah, which is even worse during RCP 8.5. And the same kind of results we can see on the ensemble of the seven models, which are in the lower panel. Here you can see a dots, which means that four out of the seven models agree on the sign of the chain. So for the RCP 8.5, that's basically most of the New Zealand area. So there we know that they, all the models generally think that the storm source in New Zealand is going to decrease for the end of the 21st century. And now Giovanni is going to show you how we are delivering the data. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure speaking to you all. And, um, Joao and Laura have shown you the hindcast and the projections for storm surge and waves. This data is fantastic, it's incredibly useful, but it actually becomes useful the moment you use it. So this is what we are doing to ensure that the data can be used. Uh, on the website, you see on the bottom right uh, the direction, the address of the website. That's the website you should go to, and you can find pages for, for example, for the storm surge. It looks pretty much like the one that you're seeing on the screen right now. And uh, you can just download the data. It's for free. Uh, what you have to do is, uh, I have to use the mouse. OK, so you can uh, choose. Uh, the type of model, for example, for the projections that you want to explore or you want to download the data. You can choose uh, the area and the location, the grid points that you want to download. And finally, you can also sure, obviously, the time range uh, over which you want to download the data. And so all of this becomes available for you to use it. Uh, the same applies for waves. Still on our website, we have generated a couple of uh, pages that are incredibly useful if you want to take advantage of the data. Uh, here you can see the general aspect of the of the page. Uh, again, uh, for the projection, you can choose the type of model and the period of time over which downloading the data. You can obviously choose the parameters that you want to download, whether it's period, direction, wave height. And it actually gets even more interesting because uh, you can actually get even more parameters uh, because we are providing the full partition data as presented by Joao. So there is really a lot of data that is there, not only the handcuffs, but also the projections until 2100. The resolution is pretty good. 
So please take advantage of this data and really make it useful for New Zealand. Finally, if you are in Auckland and you want to come and visit, we would love to show you also some of the visualizations that we are preparing for coastal flooding. Uh, this in the picture is obviously Auckland, and we can give you a little helmet, and in virtual reality, we'll be able to fly over Auckland for different sea level rises, for different storm surge and tidal levels, so you can actually see that. Uh, the situation in a uh, place like Auckland is complicated not only in 2100, but also in a uh, much shorter time frame. Okay, we are approaching the end of the presentation. Uh, all our modeling and the data we produce is submitted to international journals for peer review. So we have a few papers that come out, but there is more that will come out. and Hopefully, you will be interested in looking at them. Quick summary, and uh, we have shown you our work on wave eincast and projections, uh, storm surge eincast and projections, and we've also shown you how you can use the data. Keep in mind, these databases are free. You just link to the web, connect to the website, and download the data and use it. Uh, obviously, we are now doing a lot more work um, using these data sets uh, more on, on the local, uh, at the local scale looking at specific problems for specific areas. If you want uh, to point out at an area that is where this type of work is needed and you want to work with us, fantastic. Please get in touch, and we will love to co collaborate. OK, now let me invite Joao and Laura for a final thank you for your attention. Bye. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you very much to all of our presenters, to Joel, Laura, Giovanni, and earlier to Pablo for some excellent presentations. I'll keep my video off while I'm speaking, but I'll try to direct the questions to our various presenters. Uh, in, uh, but before I get to the questions, I uh, just have a, a compliment here uh, in the chat. Uh, such a great resource. Thank you. So um, thank you to Giovanni, Joel, and Laura. Uh, I'll start the questions with one for Pablo, uh, and that is, concerning the division into detailed and simplified modeling, do you think that you can gain some benefits by not only using RAMs or maybe CFD generally, but also some potential flow solve as a, a simpler model that can be solved more quickly, and therefore reducing your number of RAMs modeling cases? So I'll let Pablo uh, respond to that question. Okay, yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Uh, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. We need to be mindful on what we uh, approach we're, we're applying. RANS, as we know, is the most comprehensive way to simulate flows that we know about, but it is very computationally costly. So it needs to be applied to very localized areas. We cannot simulate vast areas as, as uh, Giovanni is simulating with, with RANS models. Uh, we, we only would love to do that, but we cannot do that. So yes, um, especially in offshore industry, um, fully nonlinear potential flow models are being used quite extensively. They work very, very well. And as I mentioned, uh, you need to be careful with, or, or you need to be mindful on what processes you want to solve. For example, fully nonlinear potential uh, flow models are not able to simulate uh, wave breaking but they can uh, kind of parameterize it and, and, and simulate the effects rather than overturning itself. So if you want to simulate um, certain physics, you're really constrained on which approach you want to use. Otherwise, you're uh, most better off uh, using simpler approaches, as, as you mentioned. So the best combination would be to run uh, fully nonlinear potential flow models or uh, high order spectral models in deep waters. As you move into shallow waters, uh, perhaps business or nonlinear shallow water equations make, make sense too. And once you get close to your structure, RANS modeling uh, makes sense. Now, that brings the question to hybrid modeling. Uh, and the, the very big question here is how do you do that? How do you couple this model? Is it a one-way coupling in which your models are feeding data to your more um, 
detailed models and not receiving anything back? Or are you coupling both uh, kind of in a two-way approach? So that, that would be uh, like uh, probably a topic for two or three other presentations. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a, another quick uh, question here for Giovanni, uh, which is the papers and some of the scholarly outputs that you mentioned, are those available on the Science Hub? And maybe extending on that, uh, if they're not, where can we find them? Yeah, well, the problem is that if we put them on the website, uh, then the, we get called off by the journals because we give copyrights to the journals, so we cannot actually publish the PDF. But if anyone is interested, please just send us a request and we can send them over, no problem. Just a, an email to me or Joao or Laura and we can send you all the papers. Okay, thank you Giovanni. Uh, the next question that I can see uh, that's just come up in the chat, so uh, thank you all, please keep these questions coming, we still have a few minutes. Uh, this is for Jao. So, uh, is the 10-year wave front cast likely to be extended as there have been some fairly significant wave events during 2015, for example, for Cyclone Pam, uh, and 2017 and 18, Tropical Cyclone Peter and others. So, uh, Jao, if you can respond to the possibility of extending that 10-year wave front cast. Sure, well, it is possible, of course, to, to extend it, uh, but at least like it was at first uh, made due to the funding that we had at that time and the research funding. Uh, so we have only this small issue because, but apart from that, yes, it is possible. I can step in uh, and uh, it's definitely possible, doable, and I know that uh, Joao is interested in doing it, but uh, Joao also has to finish his PhD and that is taking priority. Then uh, after the PhD, if we manage to secure some funding to do it, we realize that this would be very good for the community, but we need a little bit of funding to be able to do it. Thank you. Thanks to both of you for those answers. Uh, so if there's anyone in the audience who might be interested in following up uh, on that work uh, in a future project, I'm sure that uh, Giovanni and Joao would be uh, all ears. Uh, I'll just give a couple of minutes now. We don't have any other questions open in the chat window. Uh, a lot of uh, comments saying thanks for some great presentations, so I'd like to echo those as well. Uh, but I'll provide a couple more minutes in case anyone else wants to type a question in the chat window. Uh, I think we've had some great presentations here this afternoon, so hopefully these uh, generate a bit of uh, further discussion. I can see that a few people are typing, so we'll give them a couple of minutes. Uh, just to note also that uh, these presentations uh, in this webinar series uh, has been recorded uh, and will be sent out to all attendees as well. So uh, if you need to re-watch this or uh, maybe pass it on to those who weren't able to attend, uh, that, um, yeah, that is uh, something that is available. Uh, just a, a small correction that I'll note for the record uh, in the chat window. Thank you to Joel. Uh, so just a small correction, it's a 20-year rather than a 10-year hindcast, as I mentioned from the question. Uh, so another comment, just uh, thanking all the presenters, uh, presented, presenters for excellent presentations, uh, and thanks to the Coastal Society for coordinating the series. Um, thanks very much for the comment, and uh, yeah, it's been uh, a great uh, webinar series for me to have some small part in, and I'm looking forward to hopefully this being the first of many. Uh, again, I'll give a couple more minutes just in case others have any questions that we haven't addressed. Uh, again, the presentations are being recorded. So I noticed that a couple of people are still typing some questions. Uh, perhaps uh, while they are um, typing those, oh no, there we go, we've got one now. So this is another question for Pablo. 
Uh, can CFD or computational fluid dynamics models resolve sediment transport or morphodynamics? I'll let him answer that one and then I'll get to the final question. Thanks, Edie. Uh, yes, they can. We're working on that. Uh, there is a, a new model out there already published called ZFOAM. Um, there are other uh, models like I think Flow 3D has a sediment transport modules. You can do that, uh, but I cannot uh, speak of the results because I, I've never done that myself. But um, I'm hopefully going to to get into into that, trying to integrate some uh, sediment transport modeling into Ola Flow soon. Great. Thanks, Pablo. And I've noticed uh, another question here. So um, you mentioned in the end about urban flooding simulations. Uh, do you also do research on that and how do you approach it? Now, I'm not uh, sure whether that was uh, directed at uh, Giovanni or Pablo. I believe it might be Giovanni, so I'll pass to Giovanni first. Uh, so uh, any urban flooding uh, research uh, starting now or ongoing? Okay, so yeah, we do a lot of flooding research and a lot of flooding simulations. Um, we have funding uh, to develop a warning system for coastal flooding uh, in Sardinia. Uh, it's actually easier to get funding to do it in Sardinia than in New Zealand, believe it or not, uh, in Italy. And um, we use two approaches. One is purely parametric, where we just pile up the contribution of sea level rise, tide, storm surge, wave run-up and wave site-up, and we see if there is flooding occurring. And this system, if properly tuned, works well. Uh, the other system is probably considered to be cooler because we take the wave forecasts offshore. We use a model that is almost as good as the ones that Pablo uses. They're just faster. Uh, for weight transformation from offshore until the shoreline, and then we see if there is flooding or not. Uh, so yes, we do this type of uh, studies, and we would like to do more. This is what we are beginning to do here in New Zealand, where people tell us about specific areas where there are problems. So we can, for example, use our projections to come up with statistics of uh, potential flooding. The area that we still are not exploring is the one where there is actually urban flooding and we would like to set up a model that also simulates water um, flooding streets and shops and houses. But that's a bit farther down in the horizon. Thanks for the question. Great, and thank you very much Giovanni for the answer. Uh, I don't see too many other questions popping up on the chat window. However, um, all of our presenters are quite easy to find uh, either through the New Zealand Coastal Society or through the University of Auckland website. If you do want to follow up with them, I very much encourage you to do so. Uh, just before we close today's um, presentation, I'd just like to draw everyone's attention to our next New Zealand Coastal Society uh, webinar, which will be on the 26th of August. Uh, and there we have Anita Lewis uh, talking about microplastics within the Tauranga Harbour and the Eastern Bay of Plenty. So another excellent presentation coming up and I very much encourage you all to dial in for that one. Thanks to everyone online for being very engaged. Uh, the questions have been great. Uh, thanks again to our presenters. Uh, and I don't see any other questions at this stage, uh, so I believe that we are fine to close the meeting. Thank you all very much for your time.